Good morning from London, from the ANAF Secretariat, where it's 10 in the morning. Good afternoon and good evening um, to our um, uh, participants today. Uh, we are very glad today to have the opportunity of uh, broadcasting this webinar on evaluating contribution to change in the Philippines. Uh, let me give a warm uh, welcome, first of all, uh, to our uh, um, speaker who is connecting um, from the Philippines. So we have Teresa Audrey Esteban. Uh, welcome, uh, Teresa. Uh, we are welcoming her first because she's, she's the only one not here today in person. Uh, we are very lucky to have uh, everybody else among the panelists here in the ALNAP Secretariat Office today. Uh, my name is Francesca Bonino and I'm a research fellow here in ALNAP and I'm uh, really glad to have the opportunity of uh, introducing uh, who we have in the room today uh, to lead us uh, to the presentation and discussion. We have uh, uh, Vivian Walden, um, who is the Global Humanitarian Planning, Monitoring, Evaluation, Accountability and Learning Advisor for Oxfam. She's based here in Oxford and uh, she has been uh, um, involved in co-authoring the methodology that has been used uh, for this evaluation that has been recently completed uh, in the Philippines. So welcome to Vivian. Um, we also have uh, uh, from the um, uh, DEC Secretariat, uh, uh, Frances Crowley. She's the Accountability and Learning Advisor. Uh, we are really uh, glad to have her uh, here also with Annie Davenport. And uh, Frances has been the contact person to support uh, the evaluation um, from the um, DEC uh, Secretariat Office. So welcome to Frances. And um, we also have Juliet Parker, who is the Senior Humanitarian Performance Advisor here at Christian Aid. And she's here today to share some of her reflection on the usefulness on the report uh, and um, uh, considering also that uh, Christian Aid team have been involved in the field work uh, that has been carried out in the, in the Philippines. Also, a few words of introduction uh, for uh, Teresa Audrey Esteban. She has been the uh, study team leader um, who has led the field work in the Philippines, and uh, uh, she has a specialization in urban planning, environmental, and disaster risk management, and water and sanitation. And she has led a number of uh, exercises in, the, in Southeast Asia, in the Philippines, in Vietnam, as well as in India. Um, in terms of the webinar uh, run-up, we were thinking to have uh, Vivian Walden first uh, uh, sharing an overview on the methodology that she has uh, um, worked together with the University of East Anglia um, and developed uh, over the course of the past few years. And this is the first time that the methodology has been used on a large scale, sudden onset disaster across a network of organizations. So this is particularly interesting for us to spend a little bit of time reflecting on the methodology and on the contribution that the contribution to change methodology can, uh, uh, can give us. And uh, we are going to then give the floor to um, Audrey Esteban for her presentation. Um, she's going to cover the detail of the field work that she led in the Philippines. Then Juliet Parker will share some reflection on the usefulness on the report. We will then also hear a few remarks from, from Frances and then uh, move on to the Q&A question. And uh, I'm happy now to give the floor to um, Vivian. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Um, as you've already heard, uh, the contribution to change methodology was uh, developed by a team of four people, myself from Oxfam and uh, three people from the University of East Anglia. Um, and uh, just to say it was funded by DFID. So why are we talking about contribution to change? Well, as you probably know, um, it's really difficult to measure impact in emergencies and we have problems with comparison groups and attribution. Also, um, I don't know about your agencies, but in mine, there's a demand to demonstrate impact, but very few examples of, of impact in, um, in an emergency. Um, and then, rather than getting stuck in arguments about rigorous impact, we decided to focus on developing and testing methodologies to help evidence the contribution to change. One of the problems with traditional evaluations is that the efforts of the affected population themselves are often left out. And it becomes more about proving to the donor that we've made a difference. As agencies, we may interview people, but how often do we ask them how much of the change was due to their efforts? And using this methodology that we developed, we wanted to reverse this process. Traditionally, we've done baselines and endlines and then measured the difference. Sometimes we get very poor data, 
Um, and often our sample sizes are not representative simply because it's quite difficult to do that in an emergency. This is quite a simplistic way of measuring change. If we attempt to look at change across a large program, it may work for a single activity, such as if you're just providing water, then it's probably fairly easy to do baseline, end line. But if there are more other actors, such as local authorities, local NGOs, and community groups, it becomes a lot more complex. So if there are many ag other agencies, and we're all trying to measure the changes that occurred, we end up with several evaluations that tell us whether changes happened, or maybe not. And actually, sometimes we may actually be just uh, claiming the same results and measuring the same things. So that it's not giving us a true picture of what really happened in the situation or in our own programs. As you can see here, it may be that our program is only one of, of the interventions in the same area and that there will be a lot of other inputs uh, from the different actors in, for the, exactly the same community. So even if we think our program has made a huge impact on the lives of the affected population, in reality, it may have only played a very small role if we take all the actors and all the activities into account. As you can see here, as Oxfam, we do a lot on water provision, but actually it could be that the water has played a very small part and that things like food security, nutrition, um, and shelter have played a much larger part in bringing about change. And that's one of the reasons why we wanted to look at contribution rather than attribution, because we wanted to look holistically at a response and take into account everything that's happened. Our methodology has been published in a guide, and I'll tell you how to uh, get a hold of a copy uh, later. The idea behind the uh, methodology is that the evaluation would look at the actions of the affected population, as well as post-disaster interventions. Then it would look at other factors that need to be taken into account that could contribute or hinder recovery. These could be the economic situation in the country, the weather, the amount of funding, or in the case of the Philippines, that there was another typhoon that came through in exactly the same area and obviously had an effect on the recovery from the first typhoon. And all these factors are going to affect how quickly and how effectively the recovery process is. Because it's a retrospective study, we looked at um, how, when would be the best time to do this contribution to change evaluation. And our conclusion was that it would be best between, roughly between six months and 12 months after the disaster. If you do it too early, then the changes may not have taken place and that all you're measuring is the immediate uh, response after an emergency and you're not really looking at the longer uh, recovery pr um, process. And if you wait too long, uh, tw after 12 months, then recall becomes difficult. And we did find that in one of our pilot areas when we did it at eight months and people had forgotten not so much on livelihoods and assets but things like prices. Um, it was difficult for them to recall. And remember that we, do, we probably don't have baselines so we're doing this retrospectively and therefore it's important that people are able to recall. One of the problems with showing impact or change is that there's no comparison group or control group, whichever you want to call it. We can't use control groups in an, in an emergency, as this would simply be unethical. And although we could compare the situation of the, of the affected population to a similar group who were not affected, quite often in, in big disasters, there's uh, um, an effect also on the, on the population who may not be um, immediately affected, but they have been indirectly because there may be a loss of markets, um, they may have had to take in family members, um, and they may have lost their workers, for example. So it's really hard to find a similar community that's completely, uh, to make a complete um, a comparison. So we decided that what we would do is we would use the, uh, the affected population themselves and points in time as the different comparisons. So if you look at the T0, that's when the disaster happens. T minus 1 is the situation in those communities before the disaster. T plus 1 is just after the disaster. And then T plus 2 is further down the line, as I say, the 6 to 12 months uh, with the, uh, after the uh, uh, intervention. This way, uh, we can look at changes that have happened, and we can estimate how far communities are on the road to recovery. 
As you can see in the second diagram at the bottom of the page, you can see that we're looking at the level of recovery achieved, um, the level of recovery required, and then the contribution. And in the guide, we explain how to estimate this contribution. And I think Audrey will also be talking um, a little bit about um, the results when we, when we use this methodology. So when, uh, when can we use this methodology? Well, we recommend it for rapid onset emergencies from natural hazards um, and assessing medium term recovery, working with communities that have n that are not being displaced, and as I say, looking at contribution. What it doesn't do is uh, um, measure contribution in conflict and complex disasters, simply because I think that would be really difficult, although I have to admit we haven't tried it. It also doesn't look at process. It doesn't look at value for money, sustainability, uh, and some of the other aspects of a process evaluation. That would be something that an agency would have to do by themselves. We do think it can be adapted to slow onset natural hazards and uh, disaster risk reduction activities, but uh, we haven't tried this out yet. So this was a quick overview of the methodology that was used in the Philippines for the response to Typhoon Haiyan. And just to say that the guide is available on the developmentbookshop.com because it was published by Practical Action. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vivian. Uh, this was uh, very rich, very informative, and um, uh, given your experience also um, uh, during the development of the guide, as well as uh, in providing technical support uh, in this application in the Philippines, uh, I'm really looking forward to the question and the reflection from, from other speakers. I took note of some of the points that I'm sure are going to appetize some of our participants in asking questions. Uh, for instance, um, and the issue around uh, um, the emphasis on results as opposed to only looking at process, but also um, the attention that this methodology uh, plays on the choice of timing uh, for when to uh, commission this sort of exercise, um, but also perhaps a, a question that will come up later um, is going to be around the complementarity of this type of exercise with other sort of single agency um, uh, evaluative activity in the context of sudden onset disaster. So um, this is really some of the uh, some of the remarks I took uh, I took note of, and. Uh, now we are going to zoom in uh, in the um, uh, going to the Philippines uh, um, and uh, uh, listening to the experience of uh, uh, Audrey as she led the, the field work for this evaluation. So I'm going to give the floor to her. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francesca, and thank you, Vivian, Juliet, Francis, and to all the webinar attendees. And um, so allow me to begin my presentation with a brief run through of the events that transpired in November 8. 2013, uh, which was the day when uh, Typhoon Haiyan, or locally known as Yolanda, made landfall in the Philippines. So in November 8, 2013, Typhoon Haiyan, local name Yolanda, made landfall in the central part of the Philippines. And um, the data from the Philippine National Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Council indicated that a total of 16 million people were affected. Um, 6,300 people died, 4.1 were displaced, and a lot of million of houses were destroyed and damaged. The economic damages of Typhoon Yolanda was estimated at $230 million. At the local community level, the disaster caused major losses to people's livelihoods. Agricultural lands and aquatic resources have been destroyed, which make up 80% of the livelihoods in Leyte which is the island province highly affected by the typhoon. Households there are dependent on these industries and have been seriously affected by this devastation. This study actually aims to assess the contributions and later by the contribution agencies involved in the Yolanda recovery efforts using the contribution to change methodology, which Vivian have already explained. The study allows the Disaster Emergency Committee agencies to have an in-depth, unbiased, and outcome-based reporting on their contribution to the recovery of these target communities. The objective of this research is to gauge the contribution of the 13 DEC member agencies in aiding the recovery of disaster-affected communities in the Philippines. Rather than trying to single out one agency's contribution from another, it examines and evaluates the efforts of all aid actors as perceived by the people they are aiming to help. Uh, we are trying to 
avoid attribution uh, in this methodology, as uh, also mentioned by Vivian. Specifically, the study focuses on the well-being and livelihoods of the residents before the typhoon, before and after the typhoon, the community's response to the disaster at individual, household, and community levels, and the assistance achieved by the communities from external agencies. The thematic focus of the study revolves around housing and livelihood. In this next slide, uh, you will notice that it's the same as the, the one um, Vivian also mentioned. There's a, there's a time frame. And why are we assessing the Philippines? And why test it in the Philippines? Basically, the launch of the Contribution to Change methodology coincided with the DEX Philippine Typhoon Appeal in late 2013. The post-typhoon high-end response met the criteria of the CTC, that is, rapid onset disasters from natural hazards, assessing medium-term recovery, working with communities that are not currently displaced, evaluating contribution and looking at the contribution to recovery in general with the additional factors that all of the DEC agencies responded and the context was favorable. It was also quite good that the country also has good communications, it has a supportive government, and there are no security issues. So now we go to the study area. The study examined two municipalities in the affected area, Dulag, municipality of Dulag and Tanawan which both bore the brunt of Typhoon Haiyan and have many similarities. Both are coastal regions and the populations both rely on farming and fishing, which were the two industries worst hit by the typhoon. The municipality of Dulag is a more rural area while Tanawan is peri-urban, having you know, a close proximity with, uh, with Palo, who's, which is also a peri-urban area, and uh, uh, Tacloban, which is um, considered as a highly urbanized city. These two municipalities gave a good, go, good rural, urban, and inland coastal split. Nine of the DEC's 13 member agencies work in one or both of these two areas, running a number of diverse projects from housing to livelihood to uh, children, um, projects on children and women and others. So how, do, how did we adapt the con, uh, contribution to change methodology? The study was approached in three phases. First was secondary data gathering where the study team sought, to help, sought the help of the DEC member agencies in providing data on list of projects and barangay areas in the target, area, in the target study area. We had rapid impact assessments in their target beneficiary sites and midterm reports. These data supported the development of the evaluation design or the tools that we used for the evaluation. Second was the primary data gathering which will really provide the meat of the study. This was approached in two ways. We had a quantitative data gathering which was uh, we were wherein we used the household surveys questionnaire surveys, and qualitative data gathering with key informants, interviews, focus groups, discussions, and household interviews. We conducted 427 household surveys and 84 household interviews, which were carefully split between rural and urban areas. Key informant interviews took place with community leaders and focus groups were carefully selected mix of uh, age and gender and socioeconomic status. We, have re we had representatives from the women's group, elderly, youth, farmers, fishermen, and other livelihoods. The third and the last phase is the data processing using the primary data gathered. Results and results after were assessed at three levels to understand first the specific disaster experience at the household level, second changes in housing and housing and household livelihood before, shortly after, and currently, and the types of interventions or assistance provided to the households or communities. In the next four slides, I will be presenting briefly the results of the study, which of course focuses on the housing and livelihood. On the housing, households through their social network, own resources, and the housing assistance were able to repair and rebuild their houses. 
that was very key in their in in their ability to repair and rebuild their houses, their social networks, own resources, and the housing assistance. Respondents felt that the housing assistance was timely and appropriate, and the problem faced only by the households was that there was an increase in prices of the building materials and carpenter labor. The increase in prices of the materials delayed a significant number of households from finishing their repairs or fully rebuilding their houses. Ha having their houses repaired or rebuilt has contributed to the change in the physical state of their houses and in their outlook. Many of those who have had their houses repaired see this as a significant improvement in their lives. Community members share the same sentiment as an improvement to the lives of their residents and the general well-being of their community. That is why the contribution to change for the housing assistance has been rated as medium high. So on the livelihood assistance, the cash and in-kind livelihood assistance, as well as the training provided to the households and the community, were well received by the beneficiaries. Through these means, some households were able to restore their livelihoods. However, livelihoods of a majority of the households have still not been fully recovered. Farming households were provided with the same type of seedlings, thus there was an oversupply of these vegetables that eventually lowered the price in the market. The positive side of this is that the households have a steady supply of vegetables that they can readily consume. Coconut farmers, on the other hand, will take years to restore their coconut plantation since coconuts take 5 to 10 years to fully mature and bear fruit. Among the farming community, the rice farmers are seen to have slowly gone back to their normal farming activity. Uh, sorry, I think we seem to have lost uh, Audrey. She was actually uh, just in the concluding slide of her presentation. And she had uh, um, the last slide was uh, uh, one where she was going to just go through um, her concluding remarks on the um, opportunities and challenges that she has, um, uh, she has uh, seen um, when applying this methodology. And so just to summarize some of the points she was going to touch on, uh, as you see on the slide, um, so she, uh, to sum it up, the house building and restoration was uh, the element among the intervention that were seen as more successful, as Audrey was saying, even changes, physical changing, changes in the outlook and physical changes in the structure of the building that have been reconstructed were perceived as uh, uh, positively by the, the uh, target communities. Whereas uh, on the livelihood, uh, uh, on the livelihood side of the intervention, the assistance received um, uh, has uh, uh, more of a mixed result in terms of the change uh, perceived by the affected population. Um, so rice farmer have gone back to rice farming, although um, the uh, the yields have been have been low, and in terms of the other elements that were looked at into the in the livelihood um, intervention, she also touched on the issue of vegetable gardening, uh, which was uh, uh, quite a positive one in terms of improvement um, in the lives of the uh, lively of the household. And then she touched on the small on the small businesses that also have slowly reemerged. When it comes to the uh, cash for work intervention, um, there were mixed results in the sense that some were perceived as uh, um, helping in the uh, in a return to sort of normality. However, there is uh, the flip side of the coins that has uh, um, that has been detected with a certain distortion in the market prices. So this was the conclusion from Audrey. I'm sorry I had to uh, go through her slide. However, now we are able to go back to um, Juliet Parker from Christian Aid, uh, and uh, she's here uh, with us today because um, she would like also to share some of her reflection on the usefulness uh, on on a report and share some remarks. Thank you. Um, so Christian Aid, was, uh, as a DC member, was part of this study. Um, we are implementing um, our high-end response as part of the DC um, whole response. Um, and um, we were involved in a sample, I think, of one of the particular barangays that's part of this report. Overall, what I want to talk about is about how uh, we've received this report within Christian Aid and the extent to which we feel we can make use of it, um, and also where it really challenges our understandings of some of our processes and established ways of um, doing things. Firstly, 
we absolutely understand the principle of looking at the whole rather than the individual actors. It is a very good one and it is challenging to do it and I think this exercise has been very positive in that it has tried to um, with quite some success. So we particularly appreciated the recognition within this methodology of the capacities of the other actors within humanitarian responses. So for example, all the way through the report, it recognizes the contribution and capacities of the communities themselves in their own recovery and it is also, uh, I think, extremely good to look over time and the practicality of a retrospective study is very much appreciated in an ideal <laughs> and a non-ideal world where we rarely have baselines. Also I have to say it is difficult as an individual agency it is difficult for us to initiate these kinds of exercises during the first year of, an, of a, a humanitarian response and that's where these sorts of collective initiatives offer a real value to us because um, our program teams are heads down um, working extremely hard and it is difficult to find these learning opportunities and very difficult and um, particularly to coordinate them collectively. And in reality, actually, our program team found it to be a comparatively light exercise for them. It wasn't demanding on our staff and partners' time, which I will come back to later. And also, we recognize that the DC is a good learning forum. It's a good learning platform for, um, for the agencies within the UK. However, <laughs> all those good things, but we have found some limitations in its usefulness for us, which is partly possibly to do with the methodology in the report, but I think also because it, it, it challenges our established ways of doing things, which is never a com comfortable process. So I have a, a number of sort of criticisms, I suppose. One is that our program team were confused by having such a small sample. Sampling only late, they felt, um, limited its usefulness to us in that we cannot really extrapolate the findings from one province across the five provinces that we're working in. So it's very interesting, but actually how we can then take on board um, these findings in our other provinces, which perhaps haven't recovered so well for a different set of reasons, is quite difficult. Um, it's not very critical. We are used to evaluations that criticize us and actually our program teams found it quite uncomfortable <laughs> to not be criticized, although it does highlight some really quite poor practices by the sector in a number of different areas, but there is then no consequent criticism of us for that. Um, and I don't know if that was an intended part of the methodology, but certainly it left us feeling <laughs> exposed <laughs> and vulnerable. Um, also, it didn't pick up on the different approaches of the different agencies. Across the different agencies within the DC, there are a variety of different approaches, some which will in certain circumstances work better and others that won't. And there was no point at which the report picked up those differences. Again, it might be that that was part of the design of the methodology, but it left us feeling uncomfortable because it wasn't what we expected. There was also a feeling that it picked up a lot of findings that we already knew actually from working within those communities a lot of the evidence of recovery was very obvious to our program teams a lot of the kind of differences in practices and um, effects on kind of economic household recovery were obvious um, and there was a feeling that um, as I suppose there often is from program teams did we really need this whole exercise in order to tell us what we already felt new um, and we missed a couple of areas one was um, we we found that it was very focused on um, delivery of humanitarian assistance and less focused on any kind of um, critique of our, our approach, like how did we handle the communities, how did we interact with them, how did they feel about our presence or our interactions with them and that didn't come through because it was very much about house, addressing household needs in key areas. Um, and also I know, I understand that the um, the study was not aiming to look at attribution, um, but it leaves, leaves a big unanswered question for us in that to what extent was the humanitarian sector playing a bigger part or a smaller part in the overall recovery of Leyte? And uh, as I understand it, actually Leyte is a relatively strong economically economic prov province which enabled a lot of its own recovery. Uh, but clearly we did make some contribution but the balance of that and also any kind of understanding of whether that was the balance that we'd expected or intended it is not there. Um, and also <laughs> from our program staff in country 
actually it didn't take much of their time as I mentioned earlier so it was a very light exercise for us which um, is very much appreciated but they missed the opportun opportunity to explain our approaches and they missed that as part of their what they saw as their contribution to the exercise um, and although I can see on the flip side that the focus on the views and experiences of the communities is a very important one and we can often focus in our evaluations too much on our own processes and our own views of our own contribution that actually distort findings quite significantly. So in terms of then its usefulness, clearly we still need our own approach, our own processes and our own evaluations. This report does not answer for us the key questions that we need to answer, but it is a very interesting framing. We struggled to find much that we could action as a result. And again, this might be because it challenges our established ways of doing things, but there are no recommendations. There are only conclusions. And again, it left us feeling slightly vulnerable <laughs> about the extent to which we should be acting on this or not. Um, but again, to reiterate that absolutely we agree with the principles behind the approach and we would hope that this report would serve many masters. It might be that it wasn't actually aimed at us in the way that our evaluations are aimed at us. Um, but having been part of it, that would tend to be our expectation. The final thing was, in terms of taking forward or making any changes to our approaches, it wasn't exactly clear to us whether this would help us make any changes in our approach to the high end response, or whether actually it's looking rather bigger than that, and actually it's about us looking using this information and looking at our responses, or even bigger than that, the sector responses in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, um, Juliet. I picked up a couple of points, and I think it's, uh, um, it is uh, um, very stimulating to have the opportunity of, uh, of uh, discussing uh, um, uh, the, different, uh, the different experience and different uh, uh, views on how the methodology has been used in general, discussing the methodology in itself and the concrete application um, in, the, in the Philippines. I picked a couple of points, I'm just uh, going to reflect back to the participants, and then I have a couple of questions that um, speak to Juliet's uh, uh, point, uh, and uh, perhaps one way of going uh, about the next, uh, um, let's say, 45 minutes of the webinar would be to go um, uh, around the room and have a quick uh, round of reaction and reflection, perhaps from, uh, Vi uh, from Vivian regarding the methodology, as well as for Teresa, and then we can have the poll and, um, and uh, complete the webinar with another round of questions from the participants. So a couple of points I picked. Um, uh, I think uh, from Juliet's reflection uh, is about uh, the um, some of the points uh, uh, that have perhaps been missed uh, in this uh, type of exercise, and maybe this uh, warrants a reflection from Vivian on the methodology on how this type of approach can help uh, perhaps getting a better sense of the softer element Juliet Juliet was talking about, the interaction with community, perhaps the perception. So looking also at at uh, this type of issue, but also the complementarity of this type of exercise as a learning opportunity um, with other uh, type of perhaps more conventional exercise that also look at the approach and the process uh, um, used to deliver, um, to deliver assistance. And then there is a bigger question of the overarching contribution of, human, of the humanitarian sector as a whole uh, in the context of the Philippines where, as Juliet was emphasizing, the community themselves are the main agents of a lot of uh, the recovery um, that takes place. So these are just a few, um, few uh, footnotes I was um, um, I was uh, uh, noting, and um, and then I'm gonna um, also uh, read out loud a couple of questions we have received from some of our participants online. Jean McClaskey, um, she was uh, directing a question to Vivian. And she was asking whether Vivian could be able to share a few thoughts on uh, what is different uh, of this methodology compared to other type of evaluation she may have commissioned or managed or led in the past uh, um, in a similar in similar context. So sudden onset, large scale natural disaster. And uh, also from Jean uh, McCluskey, another follow up question for Vivian. Uh, it's a good segue. So she was asking whether uh, Vivian perhaps could elaborate on what are the main features that makes uh, this methodology um, particularly challenging if we were to adapt it to complex emergencies? So she touched a little bit on this in her overview on the methodology. Um, 
it has not been piloted in a different context, uh, such as a complex emergency, but perhaps uh, it would be good to hear um, from, uh, from Vivian, and perhaps we can also pass the floor then to Audrey uh, to hear um, her views uh, um, on this same question. Um, we have uh, uh, more questions from the participants that we keep collecting, but I'm going to give the floor now to perhaps uh, Vivian and Audrey for a quick round of reaction, and then we, go, we move on to a poll. Okay, thanks very much. Um, yeah, I mean, I th yeah, I really enjoyed listening to Juliet because I, you know, I think that's what we wanted. We wanted some critique because um, also, also, so I'm going to answer this in two ways, both as um, um, one of the authors of the methodology, but also as from an NGO. I think the the st uh, thing about looking at communities and the way we react, uh, work with communities, I think that. We, we, we should have had that. I'm, I'm, you know, there's no criticism on Audrey, I th but I think that is an important part of the qualitative methodology. I, th I think you should, you, we, we should be looking more at that. Um, and as far as the fact that it's uh, as, a, as an agency, yeah, I mean, I was thinking as well, what would Oxfam get out of this? Um, and I think the thing for me is, is it doesn't look at the process. It doesn't look at how how our approaches and how we worked. You have to do a process evaluation uh, for your own work as well as a complement uh, complementarity to this, um, because it, it it's not going to go into that kind of detail, and it doesn't replace the um, the, the evaluations that agencies do do by themselves. I think it was a sobering thought for me because I think quite often we tend to end our evaluations with, yes, we've made a contribution, we've made an impact, you know, we've done a lot for a recovery for communities. And I think it was the sobering thought that actually, um, although we had done quite a lot on shelter, um, I was quite surprised at the, at the figures that showed the number of people who whose houses had actually not been fully repaired. Um, so I suppose in that way, although it tells us sort of what we know. I think it gives us more sort of hard facts that um, definitely we can use to kind of, yeah, bring ourselves back to reality and, and the limitations of some of our programs. Um, Jean, nice to hear from you. Your uh, questions. What's different to other evaluations? Well, I think it's exactly that. I think, I think because most of the evaluations at Oxfam uh, commissions are qualitative, and quite often we do end up with nice sweeping statements that um, a pat on, our, on, our, on the back that we uh, feel that we've um, done a really good job. And, and, and I think this, this was good because it looked at, at other aspects than just Oxfam. So um, um, they elaborate with the challenges for complex emergencies. Well, I don't know. I mean, um, I suppose we could do it. I think, I think we would have to look at, uh, in that diagram of the other factors, um, and there would be quite a few things that would uh, affect uh, the outcomes. And you know, what is recovery in a in a complex emergency, especially if it's if it is co a conflict? Um, and I look at DRC or South Sudan, um, where people in refugee camps. And I think it would be extremely difficult to look at uh, any lasting changes. So I don't know. Um, I'm I'm open to suggestions, but. Um, I think it would be very challenging, and I think we'd really have to think through what it is we were going to, what we were going to look at, and how we were going to do it. Thank you, thank you, Vivian. Uh, that's that's excellent. And uh, perhaps we can uh, uh, we can give the floor also to Audrey now and hear uh, her uh, input and reflection um, on this. Hi, hi, everyone again. Um, well, uh, listening to Juliet, I, I kind of um, understand where she's coming from in terms of how they're going to use this uh, methodology and and um, how um, they know already what has been what is on ground, and uh, that this report just uh, placates, in fact, what they have already what they already know. Um, one of the things that uh, that I kind of um, stumbled on when we we started this methodology was that um, the attribution aspect. So how do you? That's very tricky because um, how how do you avoid attributing um, the change? to one agency, because that's very, very uh, key in the methodology. I think the fact that we put together, we, we assessed it or we evaluated um, a number of, of uh, agencies with, and um, glumped it in the sense that, uh, uh, and we, uh, the way we asked the, the people is, um, 
you know, we try to avoid um, pinpointing pinpointing uh, that oh they, they gave better they gave they gave better uh, materials they gave uh, this one did not give us better materials and and other things like that. So uh, we had problems with uh, before uh, when we started, but then when we developed the design the the evaluation tools, that's how we kind of uh, tried to avoid um, uh, really attributing each of the each of the of uh, the dif the different um um assistance that was that were provided to them it's difficult to assess um i agree uh and to assess um disaster areas at this time when they are also they have this feeling of of not being helped by the government or not being helped by a certain group if there was some difficulty in that, um, but I think the overall the process we were able to come up with um, a METI report that that uh, provided exactly what the CTC wants. The CTC wants us to to give them um, a report on on um, how the house housing assistance have provided these communities changes in their well-being in the same way that um, how were the livelihood assistance um, changed the lives of these people. Let's see, I, I'm a, I fear we have lost uh, um, Audrey, Audrey again. So let's see perhaps whether we can, uh, we can shake up the, the webinar a little bit more. Uh, and, uh, and now that you have heard the presentation from Vivian on the methodology and how it has been initially um, uh, designed and then how it has been used in the Philippines, um, let, let's hear from, from you, um, from all of those of you online today. Uh, the first poll uh, that we wanted to perhaps uh, use uh, today is um, based on what you heard and we don't know if you are familiar already or not with the methodology um, would you consider using the methodology um, in a response uh, if you are um, working for an operational agency who has responded to a sudden onset uh, uh, in the context of a sudden onset disaster and you have um, and your agency has been active in, in, in response terms would you consider uh, trying this methodology based on based on what you heard yes okay so th we are closing the poll now now, so we get a 96% response as a yes and an 8% as a no, and the 62% of you have voted. So at the moment we have 49 people on a line and 62% uh, of you voted. Uh, so perhaps there is an appetite to read a bit more and perhaps there is an appetite of looking at possible application as, as Vivian was, uh, was suggesting in, in different contexts. Uh, so in the next slide we are going to share with you um, how best you can get hold of the methodology and also perhaps get in touch with the DEC secretariat um, and so for us with, with Francis if you are considering using the methodology and uh, maybe you would like to uh, get in touch with those who have used it in the, in the Philippines recently. The second poll um, may also be an interesting one and ties a little bit in the discussion on uh, over the pos potential of this methodology. Do you think based on what you have heard, so we have the proponent of the methodology methodology, some reaction and reflection, um, and um, um, looking also at the possible shortcoming and gap that could be improved in the future. Do you think that this methodology has the potential of addressing some of the conventional challenges uh, that we experience in humanitarian evaluation, especially in the context of sudden onset disaster? So Vivian has touched on some of those. I'm going to talk while you have the opportunity to vote already. Um, issues with baseline, issue, issues with representativeness um, of, of sampling and, um, uh, and working with comparison group. Um, so we have four options for you, whether you think most of the challenges uh, could potentially be addressed by the contribution to change methodology, perhaps some of those, or perhaps you think you don't know enough and you would like to, uh, to know more about this methodology to see how it can contribute to that. So you still have a few seconds to vote, and uh, for this second question, uh, the results are a little bit more nuanced compared from the compared to the first poll uh, results. 
and um, it's not a tie split but close. We have a 57% 50, of you um, who are giving a positive answer, uh, suggesting that yes, there, are, there is a possibility that some of the challenges in conventional humanitarian evaluation um, could be addressed by this methodology. But there is a 43% of you uh, who could be interested to know more about the methodology but currently doesn't know enough and would require to examine a little bit more. And 67% of you have voted, so thank you for that. It means you are actively listening in the webinar and taking, um, taking action, so we like that. Thank you. There are uh, um, the sort of question we have been gathering as, uh, as the speaker were, uh, were sharing their presentation. Uh, there is a split um, in the question. Some are really specific to the methodology, and some are uh, more directed uh, to Teresa because they speak to the exercise that took place in the field. We have a specific question. Um, coming from uh, um, a colleague who is also based in the Philippines, uh, working for CARE, um, and he's the meal manager uh, based in the Philippines. And uh, he, has, um, he has asked the question, uh, especially uh, directed to, to Audrey, and the question is um, whether and to which extent the contribution to change methodology make use of participatory um, data collection or a data analysis uh, tool. So uh, at which point of the methodology that was an element of participation and by whom and how was that organized? So this is one for Audrey. There is a, a second question that we have received. Uh, this question coming from a colleague in uh, Caritas, Germany, is uh, um, about uh, the participation and engagement and different role of stakeholders in this methodology. Who are the main stakeholders that have triggered this exercise at headquarter level as well as in the field? And how, do you organ how did you organize their participation? So different stakeholders um, in a country office as well as headquarter. So this is a question uh, that could also be um, passed on to Frances because I can see that Teresa uh, Audrey still has some issue with their audio connection. Hi everyone. Um, so there are different groups of stakeholders at different stages of the evaluation that we felt that it was very important to consult with. Um, to start with, um, it was very important for the DC Secretariat to ensure that um, all of our DEC members were in favor of piloting the methodology. So we kind of canvassed support with um, different stakeholders within the DEC members, from humanitarian directors to monitoring evaluation staff, through to staff on the ground in the Philippines. So once we had this buy-in from, um, from our agencies, we were then very keen that the steer on what the kind of parameters of the evaluation should so we set up two working groups, one in the UK and one in the Philippines. In addition, um, it was really important to get data from m and &E staff in the Philippines from amongst our members, so we're very grateful to have their input providing both data and secondary information that was really essential to the evaluation team. And before the fieldwork began, another important um, area of stakeholders was um, getting local buy-in. So the Ateneo team, um, they consulted with the mayors from the two sample areas for the, for the evaluation, to, for both for permission and also to give them a good understanding of what the, what the evaluation was about. This also went down to the local leaders, to the um, area barangays, captains, who were informed about, again, the aims. Finally, and most importantly, it was to get this, the idea of what the evaluation was about to the households who were interviewed and who were surveyed, um, it was essential that they understood that this was for feedback for our members and that there was not kind of, it wasn't a needs assessment and there was you know, further um, aid connected to this. And that was another reason why we were very keen to have a recognized institution in the Philippines leading the um, evaluation because people knew the name of Ateneo and understood that this was an academic institution. Um, two other key stakeholders were, of course, the um, two of the authors of the methodology, Vivian and also Roger Pugh from the University of East Anglia, and they played a key role in guiding and development of the methodology and um, adapting it for the Philippines context, along with the a team from um, Ateneo. Um, and then Roger played a key role in validating the report to ensure the methodology had been closely adhered to when it was finally published. So yeah, there were lots of uh, different stakeholders to consult with um, throughout the whole process. Thank you.
Thank you, Francis, uh, for for this overview. Also, uh, it's interesting to touch on the uh, on the specific structure that were put in place to support this valuation. So, the role of two different working groups, one in the country and one here in the UK, that is also um, uh, quite interesting. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Yes. All right. Hey, yes. Um, on the question uh, received that we received from um, the meal manager, I'd like to respond to that. Uh, he asked about um, the CTC methodology and how it is uh, participatory. participatory. The, well, the contribution to change methodology is participatory in nature, and it involves the stakeholders and the communities. And the way we adopted the methodology, given the time frame, is we, we allowed for key informants to be involved in the, in, in, in the um, data gathering. So we had... Uh, we did had discussions and uh, on issues and challenges and changes in their communities and their households, and we also had individual household interviews, which allowed the same level of discussion within the households. And in this way, all stakeholders are covered, and different angles can, can be seen and assessed, and finally triangulated with the other tools of the methodology, like the questionnaire survey. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Audrey. So uh, perhaps a good segue to this question actually is one um, that I would like to ask to both Vivian and Audrey to comment on, uh, since we are talking about participation and, and data collection to an extent. Um, so one question is coming uh, from the UK, from Jack Phelan. He's uh, um, working with the ActionAid here in the UK. And he asked the question um, to both Vivian and Audrey, uh, asking, her, asking them to elaborate on the methodology and how, to which extent and how the CTC methodology um, is able or designed to examine, the to examine the differential contribution of the intervention on women and men, separately perhaps, or uh, people from different age group. So um, uh, perhaps this ties into a question that I also had for both Vivian and Teresa, which is on the reflection on the challenges and opportunities and whether some, there are still some shortcomings in using the household as unit of analysis. So to which extent it is possible to use this methodology to have uh, to um, examine differential results uh, um, along gender lines and perhaps also age and other vulnerability. And perhaps we can give the floor to Vivian first. Okay, well, as, uh, I mean, when we were designing the, um, the guide, we uh, were going to have a toolkit, um, and then we decided, no, because if the problem with toolkits is if you put something in the back of the book, you know, this, this is a sample questionnaire, people think that's the golden uh, uh, tool, and that if they use that, they'll get really good results. So we, we purposely didn't do it, and the idea is that you have to design your own tools, and therefore, you can put whatever you like in it. You know, if you want to have comparisons between male and female, if you want to have comparisons with disabled, uh, if you want to look at the elderly, I mean, yeah, that's part of uh, the tool, uh, the questionnaire, the focus group guides, um, the uh, key in informant interviews, that kind of thing. So yes, of course, um, it's it's you, you, it's it's up to whoever is doing the interviews to be able to bring out those differences. Um, household versus individuals or communities? Well, we did do community, I don't know if we did in the Philippines, I'd have to, uh, Audrey would have to remind me, but when we tested it in Sri Lanka um, as the, uh, the team with um, the university, we uh, did community interviews, so looking at the changes in the community as a whole, because sometimes they've got a clinic and obviously that was impacting on the community. Um, but again, I, I think you can do it at whichever level you like, really. Um, and we, we deliberately left it open uh, so that we weren't prescribing uh, any kind of toolkit and that, therefore, uh, you need to adapt it to your own situation and your own needs. Thank you, Vivian. And let's hear from uh, Audrey. Uh, yes, I would agree with uh, Vivian that um, there's, we also did the key informants interviews and focus group discussions in the communities. and. Uh, we also, with this, this uh, the results of which were triangulated with the household interviews and the questionnaire survey. I think the advantage really of using the household as a unit is that this is the same unit of measurement used in the national statistics, which makes it easy for us to check statistically if on the average there was a change, say on the income levels or a change in household size um, in the study area. As the 
com uh, the, the methodology also says it is at the household level where the changes can be observed and the changes in the daily activities and the livelihoods. I think the challenge that we face in using the household will be on the analysis and how uh, how the evaluator will analyze and triangulate the findings. For instance, during the FGD, the focus group discussion, there were a number of women who raised the issue of being more in debt and taking loans from loan sharks. So do we take this to mean that only women took loans or how about the men? Was debt also raised at the, at the questionnaire survey and household interviews? And these are the things I think that the evaluator should take into consideration when they are, they are going to um, you replicate or pilot also the same methodology in their area. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, perhaps, uh, Audrey, since, uh, uh, since you have the floor, uh, we have received uh, yesterday another question from Sophie, uh, who is completing a master um, in the U.S. and was looking into uh, this methodology came across the publication. And uh, she had a specific question on the use of technology, whether there was any consideration of whether there, are, there is a potential of using uh, um, technology in terms of the data collection, perhaps uh, uh, to uh, reach out to a larger uh, sample size. Uh, when you consider uh, the number of household visits, whether you have used uh, any um, uh, any technology or um, for the data collection during the field works uh, uh, field work, and whether you see as an opportunity um, to try something in this respect. Yeah, that's a, actually a very very good question from Sophie, and uh, we did consider uh, having used um, some form of technology that would really. Um, expedite our survey um, data gathering. However, at that time, uh, we there were some administrative delays, so it was difficult for us to to acquire these um, technology at that time. But yes, of course, if if they can use um, something like like a GIS or some other form of uh, technology in, in terms of um, data, data gathering, then of course they can use it. That would, that would be actually very, very excellent because they can already tag each house and household uh, where they have done their survey interview. So I think the methodology is open to that. Thank you. Excellent. And um, uh, there will be perhaps opportunities uh, um, following this webinar for all of those who are online and have additional questions to ask those questions either directly um, to uh, Frances if they are thinking of commissioning this type of evaluation and uh, we are going to share uh, Frances' uh, email address uh, and also the link on the DEC website where you can download the, um, the, the whole evaluation. But also you have an opportunity um, uh, since you are all members of the uh, ALNA up, um, humanitarian evaluation community of practice to ask some of those questions to, um, uh, to the community of practice, uh, practice member because there is a lot of experience um, in the COP as well. Um, perhaps uh, uh, I would like to move now from data collection. We heard a couple of remarks around the use of um, household as a unit of analysis on the possibility of, um, of um, disaggregating data. Perhaps let me move forward uh, um, with, uh, with one question that I have and now as we close um, as we approach the close of the webinar um, thinking more in terms of use and requirements if agencies are considering piloting this methodology what are the uh, what do you think, perhaps this is for Audrey, but could also be for Frances and, and Vivian uh, if they wish, what are the minimum requirements in terms of uh, staffing the evaluation teams, which sort of skills mix you would advise, um, are there any tips you feel you would like to share in terms of maybe expertise of the evaluation teams, also in terms of timing and perhaps if there is any sort of uh, um, uh, testing time for the data collection tool, um, preparation to the field of the field work. Uh, and the, the, the resources are located. So, uh, you know, a question around the staffing, expertise, timing, um, since it's fresh in your mind, uh, the experience you had in leading this exercise, what are the sort of minimum requirements you would advise to have in place? Yeah, hi. Thank you for the question. I think f on, in terms of staffing, um, it will really depend on the number of, of your sample. Um, especially if it's a, it's a big sample, then you would, need, you would require a, a a big number of uh, of researchers or enumerators, um, and I think what's very very crucial is for you to have someone who's very knowledgeable in um, 
interviews, especially on ground, someone who has a background on, on social community development, someone who really knows how to relate with uh, the communities, and someone who has very, very good experience in conducting focus group discussions at the community level and in relating with government with government and government officials, um, even even if these government officials are from the from the community, um, that's one. Um, the number of enumerators will, of course, be dependent on the number of sample size that you will have. In our case, we had um, ten enumerators, which which were we where in um, we got from the local community and which we deployed in uh, in in Dulag and Tanawan. So that be, you can give a you know you can probably have a feel feel of how many people based on the number of sample size that you have. Um, maybe for me I think a, a good sample of around uh, 10 to 10 to 20 enumerators if it's going to be really big and if you have two sites and a team of uh, of people who would be doing conducting the interviews um, around five would be good. That would be less stressful, <laughs> I think. Excellent. Thank you. We always like this a practical uh, tip um, uh, coming from, uh, from an evaluation team leader. So thank you, um, Audrey. And uh, let's maybe give the floor to Vivian for her remarks. Um, I guess I just wanted to touch on whether uh, uh, an agency could do this themselves, or whether uh, which would obviously be cheaper, or whether we, sh or we should hire a, um, a, a local university. Um, um, our experience when we t t tested this in uh, Sri Lanka, when we used the University of Batakaloa, um, we found that uh, there are two points really. One is um, that you're not raising expectations because if you're coming back 12 months later and you drive up in a nice white car and get out wearing an Oxfam t-shirt, you've immediately sent the message, we're here, um, there's a possibility that we're here to help again. So I, I think that was, that was one of the key learnings we got. And also you're independent. If you're using a, a university, they're neutral um, and therefore I think uh, probably you get better information because uh, just the fact that uh, just even if you don't wear a t-shirt, if, if they know you're from an agency, it immediately biases because um, they feel that they should be telling you what you want to hear. So, so um, it, thinking about resources and, and minimum requirements, I mean obviously you, you need funding if you are going to hire um, a, a local university. Excellent, uh, thank you Vivian, uh, these are also very good tips uh, and um, let's hear from Frances a few points to complement to this, thank you. Just some very practical kind of lessons learned that we picked up on in our debriefing with both um, Ateneo, um, the institution, and with, um, with the authors of Methodology, particularly Roger. Um, I think because this is um, there's such, a, such a specific time frame for this methodology, we felt that um, a really good lead-in is needed for um, planning, and um, we were perhaps a little rushed in this. And I think Ateneo suggested that six months to do the the planning to kind of ensure you've got the parameters for the study and have developed all the survey tools, etc., is really important. Um, another thing that they recommended um, was that there's a real need to be precise about exactly what information is needed and they advised narrowing the focus to key areas that will really demonstrate change and recovery and they felt that the scope had perhaps been a bit too broad um, in, in some of the survey questions. However, on the other hand, um, the, I think um, Roger, was, um, who's one of the authors, was keen to, to make the point that um, you don't want to narrow the, the focus too much um, to restrict the scope because um, it's, and, and in fact you just, you need to adapt your tools so that, for example, the, the survey can um, be quite wide but you, sorry, the survey is quite restricted but the, the, um, the interviews can kind of slightly work harder to ensure that when you're talking to households and interviewing them at that level, that you're getting a really clear understanding of, um, of what happened. Ateneo suggested that perhaps carrying out spot check interviews before the survey um, and inter interview questions are developed um, can ensure that any other key areas or factors that could influence recovery are picked up on at that stage before you go on to develop the survey and questionnaire. Thanks. 
Excellent. I'm taking frantic notes because I think these are all a very, very, um, a very good tip and a sort of uh, a tip that I'm sure a lot of uh, participants could be interested in uh, taking into account and maybe even go back to uh, either Vivian or, or Francis. So I took note of the uh, lead time, preparation time, and maybe this could be one of the strong points also of this methodology to have the opportunity of reflecting on the right, on the best timing um, to be able to ask a question around recovery. So six months of planning, um, spot checking, uh, interview um, uh, during the development of the survey tool. These all um, look very, um, very valuable uh, tips. And um, since we are now on the uh, end tail of the, of the webinar and we are thinking about uh, um, tips for other but also currently with this report, uh, what are the expectation of use and uh, uh, what are the reflection on uh, how to um, make the best use of this product uh, now that it is out? Um, I wanted uh, to share a word of, uh, I suppose, praise and, uh, and appreciation to the DEC Secretariat because in the context of this evaluation um, I could really appreciate how they try to customize and tailor and produce different type of communication product for different audiences. So if you go online, uh, and I'm going to now show uh, on the screen uh, um, the, the, the website where you are going to be able to see um, both Francis' email and also where you will see the full evaluation of the contribution to change Philippines you are also going to be able to download a very useful four-pager overview on the methodology itself. It's a little teaser, um, so you're going to have the sort of the highlight from this methodology um, and then you can decide to, uh, to go and consult the whole uh, publication that, that Vivian has, uh, has mentioned. You are also going to be able to see um, a very useful three-pager um, evaluation brief that was also prepared by colleagues in the DEC Secretariat. And so these are different communication products for different audiences and uh, in your organization um, um, you may want to present uh, the full menu of options if people are interested in this and do not want to plunge directly into um, the, 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 the full evalu evaluation report. So this is just a quick note on, uh, on, the, on the usefulness of customizing sort of different products um, and different shorter, um, shorter um, communication tool for different um, specialist and non-specialist audiences. Um, and in terms of use and possibility of using this report, perhaps a, a final remark from uh, um, uh, Juliet. Uh, now that the evaluation is out, what is the expectation uh, in terms of use? Uh, um, uh, could be here in the headquarters with our colleagues, uh, uh, both within and outside the evaluation department, but also with colleagues uh, um, in the country program. And uh, maybe we could also have then a final remark from Francis on how it, could, it will be used by the DEC Secretariat. Thank you. So I suppose um, from my perspective as one of the member agencies, I I'm still a little confused. <laughs> I think that uh, Vivian mentioned, you know, this, this report is full of hard facts, which is extremely um, interesting, definitely, and, and gives us a kind of overview and a framework. Um, within which we can then kind of recognize uh, where our kind of priorities might match up and align or not or those sorts of things. But I'm still not exactly clear in this instance, in this kind of piloting of the methodology, exactly where the findings are, are kind of aimed, whether it's at agency, individual agencies or at the sector or, um, or actually as a kind of contribution to the sector over time. Um, I think that, I mean, Certainly within Krishnaid, I think I would be very interested to pilot the methodology again and to, and to use this experience. Um, so I think the, the intentions of the methodology are very strong and the practicalities of, of then implementing that um, requires some practice, I'm sure, in order to uh, further refine the product that you end up with. Um, but and, and I would also be interested to see the extent to which we could extend the methodology to look more at the perceptions of, uh, from beneficiaries on the, the quality of interactions between the different stakeholders. I think we would be particularly interested to see if we could then factor that in and, um, and expand um, the scope of what we were looking at. 
Thanks, Julia. That's really interesting. That's the first of the, the feedback that we're getting, and I think that's really what we're after. This was a pilot, and we're really keen to hear more of the views of our agencies, but also from the wider audience as well as to how useful this can be and the different ways that it could perhaps be adapted um, before the DUC consider using it again. You know, it remains a question mark over whether we would, um, but I think it's been a really useful process for us, and I'd just like to say thank you to all of those who've been involved in this and for um, you know to Anna as well for giving us this opportunity today to kind of launch the feedback process. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Francis. These are a really a good remark to conclude on a positive note on this. And uh, um, who knows, perhaps uh, we will be here in uh, another, I don't know, six, eight months' time. If there are other agencies who are piloting or give it a go at this uh, methodology, um, maybe uh, we could have a series uh, of webinar where we can share the experience or emerging learning from other agencies who are using this. And, and in fact, just as we were talking, we have a colleague from British Red Cross uh, uh, Laura, actually, who was just uh, uh, sharing, uh, sh asking a question whether this methodology, you know, could be applied also looking at longer time frame, maybe in the post disaster. So this speaks very much to the point that Vivian was mentioning before that this is a pi there has been a lot of piloting where when the methodology was developed, but also this is the first time it is a fully fledged process that went uh, into commissioning and man managing this in a large scale disaster across a network of agency. So definitely the potential is there. I can see Vivian. Uh, and nodding as well, so it's encouraging to see um, different agencies who are um, who are intrigued by this, to say the least. And uh, let's conclude on on on, uh, on this webinar now. And um, let me remind you that you can download the full set of, of products, the evaluation and the accompanying um, evaluation brief on the DEC website as well as the, on the ALNAP one. Get in touch with Francis um, if you are interested to hear more, and uh, get in touch with us uh, if you like to also suggest a topic for a webinar. Um, where we could showcase some of your um, evaluation like we have done today. Thank you for joining and um, we look forward to hear you again in the community of practice on the virtual conversation room.